Welcome back to the shop, friends, on this beautiful, crystal clear and cold New Year's Eve day uh, to part three of the sturdy oak sled or sleigh. So today we're going to be building the slats and kind of the front, the bull nose or the front connector portion of it to tie everything together uh, using the red oak. So I've got everything prepped here today. Uh, and, I, you know, I went ahead and I, I like to do things traditionally when I can, but the reality of it is, is trying to prepare the stock, meaning turning the, you know, big boards into small boards or the usable boards, doing everything by hand is, uh, well, it's tedious. It's very, very laborious. And uh, I, I, I wish I had the time to do it, uh, but I don't because I can simply knock, you know, get the rough shape out with the table saws and the power tool. Uh, and so that's what I've done. So I've cut the slats here. They're two and an eighth by, what are they, three eighths? Um, two and three eighths by whatever the length you want it to be. And then here will be the front piece. But we'll, we'll, we will finish everything and we'll try to use as many of the traditional tools as, as possible. But I do use the power tools to prepare the stock. All right, so let's, uh, let's jump into it. I want to show you a little before and after what the wood looks like uh, with a machine finish versus... Um, a hand plane finish right here you can see and one of the one of the reasons why I use the hand plane is is to remove the tool marks in the tool uh, as you can see right here and this is you'll see this is the marks from the table saw and you will see this is kind of a bit of a burn and there's actually it's stepped a little bit now if you have a really good table saw with a really good blade you can minimize a lot of these things I have uh, I don't have that this blade blade is on its last leg ready to be changed so it, it mars things up a little bit but that's okay so when I'm when I'm doing this let's say when I want this to be completed and finished at 3 8 of an inch what I'll do is I'll rip this on the table saw um, and a 16th of an inch over a larger and that gives me a sixteenth of or an eighth of an inch yes yeah, excuse me sixteenth of an inch so that gives me a thirty second of an inch on each side that I can hand plane down and to remove and take out all the tool marks but one thing that, that may not come through in the camera is that uh, the tools the, the left the, the wood left from the from the carbide tool um, is very flat and uninspiring it's not not very pretty where when here you have a hand plane piece of oak that um, the cells in the wood have been sliced and they have a, a, a shine, a, a bit of a luster to them that uh, just can't be re replicated by a machine. Sandpaper does, this, does the same thing as a tool. It makes it very flat and kind of boring uh, where the, the hand scraped or the hand cut. Uh, there's, you, you can feel it. You can see it right away. It's, it's really beautiful. So let's take a minute and we'll, and I, we'll hand plane this last slat down. You guys just missed Jack. Bless him. He brought me a hot mug of coffee. Mrs. W is raising that boy right. He's going to make someone a fine husband someday, I'll tell you that. All right, speaking of fine, look how beautiful those slats turned out. The slats uh, are they're uh, running wild, so we'll cut we'll trim the ends. Uh, I have one end, this end here trimmed uh, all nice and square. Uh, the other end, we'll, we'll wait on those. But aren't those pretty? That really looks nice. They ended up to be uh, hand plane them down 3 8 thickness, 2 and an eighth, and there'll be uh, roughly quarter inch spacing or so between them. So now we have to do the tricky part because we can't have these slats just hanging out over the front of the sled. They'll be all wobbly. We need something to tie it together as well as the front runners. So here's what we're going to do. This is a piece of, uh, this is a piece of oak here that is, what is it, inch and an eighth by inch and three quarters by 12. And we're going to cut, we're going to try to, I have a tool here that's really cool. I uh, haven't used it very much. Um, to, we're going to try to hand cut a dado in here so that these slats will fit in there nicely. They'll nest right inside there and that will tie into the runners and make it nice and strong. That's the, that's the idea anyway. So let's chuck, chuck it up here in the vise and see if we can't uh, get this hundred year old tool back in action. So the next step in our sleigh is we've got to put a dado. It means we've got to cut a, a dado in here for this to the front of the slats to fit inside. And tradition, you know, traditionally, um, from what I understand, that was done with, or one way to do it was with, well, this tool right here. This is one of my most prized uh, possessions right here. And, you know, tools like this are, are one of the main reasons why I insulated and heated the shop. 
um, and where I keep it heated just to look after them. Um, because with the old shop, it was cold and damp in here, and, and they were starting to get surface rust on these things, and I just couldn't have it. They're just too special. Like this one here. The, so this one is really a treasure. This is a number 50 Stanley uh, plane, very rare. Um, and I have the original box right there. All the original pieces are included. And check this out. This is a really wonderful. This plane can be used for, um, for doing uh, rabbits. Uh, for doing uh, beading, like a beadboard walls. And look at that, I've, I've got all of the original um, bits with the, with the case in there. Isn't that something? These are, the, these are the beading bits right here. You can see eighth inch all the way up to half inch. And then these are more for plunging, for like doing our rabbits and, and such there, but they're all included. At the three eighths, I've got it installed because that's what we're gonna be using today. And ironically, I, I've never used this. I don't know if it's ironic. Uh, I've never used this, really used this tool apart from maybe when I first got it, I might have, you know, kind of played around with it. But so we're going to be kind of learning together. So what, what we're going to be doing is, is we need to do uh, something like this. You see that right there in this, in this front piece of wood for the sled. And th this is a practice block that I was kind of playing around with. And I don't know that I completely understand how to use this thing. I went online and there was precious little instruction on, I mean, there was a few guys using them, uh, but there was a little information on how to set it up. So I may not be doing it right. So if you do know how to use this thing in, in this application, please do let me know. So some of the interesting uh, factors or parts of this is, is that this here is the sliding fence. So, uh, oh, it's just beautiful. Look at that, it's got a rosewood handle. It's just beautiful, nickel plated, gorgeous. And there you can see is the, is the cutting blade right there. And then it's got um, a couple of uh, wing nuts here for, for depth stops, right? We can loosen that and we can set the depth that we want to cut with it. Uh, it looks like it does lots of things and I don't, I don't have it completely all figured out. Even, it's even got the little knickers. That's the little nicking blades that they're stored there in the housing that if you're gonna go across the grain that you install right there to pre-cut, to pre-cut there before the iron goes through to pre prevent you from getting tear out. But I, I, I wanted to share that with you. I thought it's just a delightful, delightful little tool. And then of course it's got an adjuster here that kind of corresponds with the teeth and, and that that moves that, that iron and changes the depth from the Stanley 50. Isn't that neat? All right, friends, should we give it a go? See, <laughs> see how it works? I, I sure hope I have it set up properly. One thing I'm just not clear on is I, I can't figure out a way for the life of me to set the, to really to set the depth of it. Um, I just don't, I'm just not, not exactly sure. I would really like to know from someone who has experience with these, but let's, let's give it a shot here. And, and so we'll start on the end and see, see what happens. I kind of nick that down there. This is oak. Pretty, pretty hard there. So it seems what I read somewhere was you, you start on the end like that and then gradually work your way back. You know, that, what, a, what a tool that would have been back in the day. I mean, now we could put a dado blade on a, on a, uh, use a router or a dado blade on a table saw and man, it just makes such short work of this. But think about if you had to do that by hand, you had to do this uh, you know, with the grain, uh, with a chisel, um, boy, that would be tedious, wouldn't it? I'll bet this was really a, uh, a revolutionary tool in its day. The, the, you see how that drags inside of there. I mean, it's somewhat allevi alleviated if I continue to put a little bit of ballastol on it, lub lubricant, but I just feel like I'm doing something wrong. It's, it's kind of a delicate tool, and I, I wonder if I need to put this much muscle into it. That, that ballastol really, really helped. It might just be just take some practice. Oh, 
Well, I got the half inch dado in there, but boy, it just does not, it seems like I'm, something is just not, not right. But I don't know, I'll have to find, figure it, that out. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's, it went pretty quick. Um, nice half inch deep, cutting from both sides. So that's kind of what we're going for. I mean, it probably took me five minutes or so with that tool, but I, anyway, enough of that. Let's see, uh, see how our slats fit. So let's see how these, slats fit in here. So I planed them down a little bit thinner on the leading edges there because I don't want them to be too tight. Um, this wood is so dry. Actually, we can do a moisture check on it here if you want. Uh, give me a second here. Let's see if they all fit. Uh, this wood is so dry that um, when we do take it outside, it will, even if it's waterproof, you know that they do t tend to absorb a little bit and swell up a little bit. If they swell up too much, then they'll break. They'll break that um, they'll break that oak leading edge there. So having them a little bit loose in there is kind of by design, so that seems to me. But that looks that looks really nice. I think that's gonna be a good way to secure the front of that. Let's do a quick moisture check. I'll kind of show you about that. So this is a digital moisture meter. Uh, this is just one I got off of Amazon. They, they used to be really expensive, and of course, you know, now everything is made, many things things are made in China, and, and they're more affordable now. This is uh, imp kind of important to have if you're doing fine woodworking to know when your lumber is going to be stable. You know, I think high-end carpenters, what I've read, they like to see moisture contents in the wood between 7 and 8% uh, before they would consider it to be completely stable and safe. Um, safe meaning is, you know, just like us, so, you know, if you've ever uh, jumped, had a bath or got in the shower and, and weighed yourself before and after, you'll notice that you will be heavier after. Your body will absorb water through your pores and through your skin, gaining weight. Wood's the same thing. And as it absorbs water, of course, it gets bigger. And if you have really tight tolerances or um, mortises and tenons in delicate woodworking, they can fail and crack. Or they can compress themselves, and when they do dry out, then they become loose. That's where you get a chair that's all wobbly. So it's kind of important to know. So you can test that uh, with these with these simple gauges. Now, there's also ways to do it. They would test back in the day. Uh, you could take a uh, material uh, that you wanted and you would cut uh, some small chunks of, of it and you would weigh it on a scale. And then you would put those chunks in an oven under a certain heat for a certain amount of time and bake the moisture out of it. And then you would weigh it afterwards. And that's still used today with, um, I think with the Forest Service, I don't know if they still do it, they did a few years ago, trying to determine what the moisture contents were in fuel models, heavy timber and such. But you can, the calculations are out there. So if you have just an oven, uh, you can do that yourself if you want to try it and find out. But this of course is a lot easier. So these gauges have two prongs, two sensors. Um, and I don't know all the science, but I'm assuming that they uh, will measure uh, something between the two points giving a moisture content. Now I'm not breaking the skin, but just, you know, we are, we have a lot, we're mostly made out of water. So we're showing 33% just on my finger right there, right? But if I take these slats, uh, which, which is really interesting. So this particular piece right here has been in a heated shop for a long time, uh, over, well, I guess probably close to a year or so. So if I test that, we'll see what's our moisture content there is between about 5%. So that's really good. Super stable, really, really dry. Now, if we test the stuff that I got, uh, now this uh, here was outside, um, but it was under cover. So it's been outside of my shop in my, in my wood stack. It was some old oak flooring uh, that I had uh, that I just cut down to make the slat. So if we check, check it, it's, it's only been in, heated here for 24 hours. See, we're at 10%. So that's the difference between being inside the heated shop and outside under cover, 10%. But because of what it is, um, I'm comfortable with that. You know, we're really close to 9-10%. By the time uh, this sits in here for another 48 hours or so, it might even be dry. It'll be drier still. So one last thing we'll check. So we'll take, we'll, whoops, we'll take the, uh, the piece that I bought, uh, the red oak from the lumber yard that was also uh, in a heated shop and they guaranteed it, guaranteed to me that it would be under 10%. Uh, it was heated and under cover. I don't know how long, but we can check that and we'll see here that this is super dry. Yeah, 
it's showing yet no moisture content in it, which wouldn't surprise me because when I where I purchased it, I noticed that there was a big gas heat register that was blowing on the wood stack. So um, that's really dry. That's not going to go anywhere. So how accurate is this? I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know, uh, to be honest with you, but it seems to be, it seems to work. I haven't had any luck with it. Like if I take it outside and right now and check some firewood or a living tree, uh, the moisture content's super high. You know, I get like 70% or something, but yeah, it's kind of a cool, a cool deal right there. I'll see if I can find the leak where I purchased this. I know it was on Amazon. I don't think it was very expensive, but kind of a fun toy to play with and really helps you, especially it's a good good rule for checking um, moisture content for fuels as well in lava and fires. You just around here and kind of play with it. So, well, all of this science has taken up our time for videos, so let's get it uh, wrapped up and we'll have to continue on the next part. So welcome back everyone to this beautiful winter day. What is it today? January 2nd, 2018. And winter is is full, fully engaged on the home. Said, boy, the poor heart racer. She loves to go skiing, but she uh, she struggles so badly in the snow. <laughs> she she's gotten to the point now where she's realized that she doesn't have to go out. She can turn around and go home. We've had to go back and get her, and we we lost her just the other day. Mrs. W called and was frantic, and she went on a run, and the heart racer was gone. And I jumped in the van to start try to find her. And she was uh, she was trucking at home. She's just decided that she'd had enough, <laughs> and that was it. So, let's see. So, what do we got going on? So, a couple things I wanted to address. Uh, snowblower video. I uh, I had everything prepped to do the snowblower video on that first dump that we had, and I had some issues uh, with the blower itself. So there's two components to it. There's the hydraulic power pack on the back, which is the Yanmar side, which um, is is not the issue. I'm 99% convinced. I think there's something up front. It just wasn't spinning fast enough, and it wasn't working properly. And so I am working with the engineers at Skids Pro, Pro in Yanmar to try to diagnose that. So that will be coming up. It's just um, I, it's uh, kind of a prototype, so that's to be expected. Uh, the other thing is uh, I, I, I will be doing the uh, last part of the top 50 tools. I'm sorry I've got everything laid out. I've just... Uh, just haven't I haven't got to it but I will I will get to it how about I'll get to it this year um, what else is there big surprise coming up very very big surprise coming up I can't say more uh, but all will be revealed shortly um, I should, should probably quit talking well thanks for watching and we'll see you guys on the next video